Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Just yes. bang, bang, bang. This conference doesn't stop. Hello. Daniel. Good morning. Nathan, do you go to Austin Kaiser? No. No? Okay. The He's hospital? A, no, he, no, Austin Kaiser is a massage therapist in Houston. <laughs> oh, goodness. I know Austin. Yeah. Sorry, I just muted myself. I, yes, no, I know. Austin. I muted That's you funny. accidentally. I muted you accidentally. I'm because I'm noisy. Uh, do you do you do you go to Austin? That's I do. excellent. Yeah. Right, so our talk this morning is what students want advocating for OER amid other course material mothers, uh, mothers, uh, models, sorry. Um, and our speakers are Daniel Williamson, Managing Director of OpenStax, and Nathan Smith, uh, who is the OER coordinator at Houston Community College. They have brought some students with them and they will be introducing them in a few minutes. Uh, and so take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle. Well, I am so thrilled to be here. Um, like Michelle said, my name is Daniel Williamson. I'm the managing director of OpenStax, which I like to think of kind of like air traffic control. I make sure that everybody has the right amount of fuel and they can get where they're going and they don't run into each other as we're producing a bunch of freely available open uh, source textbooks. Um, so hopefully most of you know uh, about OpenStax. Um, and I first want to start by just saying thank you all um, for joining the session. Thank you for the hard work that you all have put in this year uh, and your commitment to your students. Uh, this has definitely been a difficult year. Uh, hopefully I, you know, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel uh, and hopefully things will get back to normal. But I know that each one of you as educators have poured your heart and your, your, your blood, sweat and tears into making sure that this year um, could go on for your students. Uh, and I just wanna thank you and acknowledge that, that work. Um, at OpenStax, our mission is to transform learning so education can work for every student. Um, the ways that we do that are really fourfold. Um, so we have our textbooks, and Symphony, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, our textbooks, um, most of you have probably seen our brightly covered, colored covers. Um, we have now 42 freely available, openly licensed textbooks in our library. We also provide courseware and homework technology um, to keep students engaged. Uh, we provide a, a, a full suite of researchers that look at the ways to leverage cognitive science to improve um, student success. And then another final way that we, we engage is we advocate for ways to improve access and learning for all students. Advocate both on campuses, but also uh, in the legislature. And so today I'm going to be talking mainly about this uh, fourth bucket, this advocacy bucket. Um, and I think it's we're we're at a pretty neat inflection point where you know new models are coming around um, that could potentially lower the cost for students, um, but we need to question you know what at what cost. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, OpenStax is very much focused on improving access and learning for all students. Here's a list of all of our our textbooks that are available. This book this book list is constantly changing. Um, we have now, I think, 11 additional titles that are in flight. In fact, I don't know if Nathan's going to mention this, but Nathan is actually working on one of our new titles uh, as we speak. He is one of our, our lead authors for um, philosophy, which will be coming out sometime in the next year or so. So keep your eyes peeled for new titles that are coming available. Um, we have about 36,000 faculty adopters um, that are currently using OpenStax freely available uh, textbooks. Uh, over the course of, I guess now, going on nearly nine years, so almost a decade, we have served 14 million students. And those that has translated to $1.2 billion in student savings uh, that would have otherwise been spent on textbooks. Um, and this is all thanks to the hard work that you all have done, 
to advocate for uh, lower costs for students, to look out and find uh, freely available and open source uh, materials that you can incorporate into your classroom, and for frankly taking the plunge and switching from uh, using traditionally published materials to using open textbooks, not just from OpenStax, but from OER providers all over um, this space. So today I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna give you a brief modern history of the course materials market as kind of setting the stage for how things have changed uh, since around 2012. Um, and so one of the ways to kind of frame this is to look at this often cited uh, cost of, um, uh, I guess, Bureau of Labor Statistics market um, analysis, looking at how things have risen um, over or below the cost of inflation. So most of you have probably seen this chart. All the things in red have, the prices have risen, risen faster than overall inflation, which is that black line uh, right in the middle of the, the page. And then everything in blue is actually decreased and become more affordable over time. Up near the very top, you know, we see textbooks. Um, they've risen incredibly fast, much faster than inflation. Uh, and you know, this astronomical rise over the past seven decades in total cost is frankly one of the big reasons why open educational resources gain has gained traction over the past few years. So in 2010, when OpenStax was starting to, to come into the mind's eye of our founder, Rich Baranek, um, it was not uncommon for printed textbooks to cost 200 to 400 dollars. Um, in response to this outrageous expense, the market started responding with creative innovations, the rise of the secondary book market, the rental market, and also at the same time, as I mentioned, OER providers like OpenStax began to publish a library of freely available, customizable open source textbooks. Over the next decade, um, or I guess almost nine years, um, the, 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 we've begun to really gain some tractions. And this, this traction uh, in terms of these disruptive uh, innovations began to cut significantly into the publisher margins. Um, so if we go to the next slide, what I've done here is really just pull uh, one more slide. I began to pull some of the different uh, snippets over the last years that highlight some of the new strategies that publishers are using. But I'm going to quickly kind of go through what's happened from you know, 2010 until now. So in an effort to reduce um, the margins for students and lower the, the, the cost, uh, as we started working to reduce the, the cost for students, um, publishers started to see, you know, a decrease in margin and their sell-through rates began to fall. So many of these publishers attempted new strategies. Um, one of the first strategies that we saw was uh, the publishers actually increased the price on printed textbooks to make up for the loss um, that they were experiencing from emerging disruptors. So the idea here being if we charge more, fewer students have to buy the book in, for, in order for us to receive, receive the same amount of profit. Okay, so that's the first thing that happened. The next thing that happened was they began to release regular updates to the books, um, often just shuffling the in-book questions, but not significantly changing or updating the content of the books. So the goal here was to make it more difficult for students to purchase used books um, because the assigned questions might be different from in the new edition. Uh, and so thinking about it again in terms of sell through, if the students had to purchase a new book every single time a new book came out uh, to get the right question, then their sell through rates would be higher. The next thing we started to see was that the publishers began bundling access code cards, physical access code cards, with printed physical textbooks. Again, these one time use access codes limited the resale value of the products and actually increased the sell, uh, and were intended to increase the sell through rates for the products uh, from the major publishers, attempting to cut out the used market, the resale market, um, and the rental market. So now, in looking at this model, now the publishers and bookstore companies are introducing uh, a new purchasing tool. Um, that automatically bills students for their course materials. Often these uh, purchasing mechanisms remove or obscure student choice. And in some cases they remove it altogether. 
Um, the goal here again is to improve the sell-through rate of the publisher products. In fact, in a recent analysis by the Student Public Interest Research Group, they found, looking at a bunch of different contracts, they found that many of these automatic billing program contracts place student purchasing quotas on institutions in order to get the best rate. So basically, you have to guarantee us, institution, that you will get X percentage of students to buy this product, otherwise we're going to increase the price. The way that this, mar this model, this new um, automatic purchasing model works, um, it's first important to note that these are not new products, right? This is not a new product that's going to enhance your students uh, educational experience. It's simply a new way to bill students for the materials. Um, these products are called by many different names. You might have them on your campus. Some might be inclusive access or day one or some other branded uh, version of this, but the mechanics are fairly simple. Here's how it works. Publishers or bookstores work with institutions to negotiate some sort of deal to implement this, um, this, this model. The instructors are then asked to choose books from an approved uh, list or catalog if they want. Um, the instructors then select the book they'll assign to students, perhaps through one of these automatic purchasing programs. And then the students, when they enroll in the course, um, choosing to use one of these products, are automatically given access to the books, usually digitally. Um, the students' accounts are then billed for the books directly, uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of how this, this model all comes together. So at OpenStax, we are incredibly supportive of efforts to substantially reduce what students spend on textbooks without reducing quality. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. We believe that these automatic purchasing programs can work for students, but there are important changes that are needed to make sure that these really work for students. So one, one change that we wanna see happen is that these programs should be opt-in. Right now, these, student, these programs are typically opt-out, meaning a student is automatically enrolled in this program and then must physically click, or I guess digitally click the opt-out button. Um, by changing these programs so that they are opt-in versus opt-out, it will improve transparency of pricing so students actually know what they're being billed for before they make the choice to, the, to enroll in a course. Um, they allow students to vote with their feet on whether or not it's a good value. Um, for instance, if these programs offer significant savings for students, other, other, other options in the market, and they provide good value, I believe that students are rational and they will choose them. Um, the next change that we'd like to see with many of these programs is if they are not opt-in, that the price of the material should actually be rolled into tuition costs and billed through student tuition, not a pass along fee to the student. This means that the entity purchasing the products, in this case, the institution, um, would be motivated to keep costs low and look at other alternatives like open educational resources uh, in order to manage those costs. Um, and it wouldn't just pass along the cost to the students. I also think that this, in, this would improve overall college cost transparency for students and they wouldn't get hit with extra bills after enrollment. Finally, in, the, uh, in both of the above suggestions, I think it's really important that when we move to these types of digitally distributed um, platforms and pieces of content, that we take every effort to ensure and protect student data. So one way to do that is to require explicit disclosure um, of what data is collected and how that data is, will be used um, and could be used uh, in the future and also allow students to opt out. Um, from having their data collected. So right now, without these changes, students are not particularly th thrilled uh, about automatic purchasing programs. Uh, and in the terms of, of LaVar Burton, I'm sure you all remember this, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, here are just a few snapshots of different students bemoaning uh, these automatic purchasing programs. Uh, there are many of these if you go on, and on Twitter and just kind of look. And in some cases, students see that the price that the, the inclusive access or automatic purchasing program uh, is assigning to them is higher 
than what they're finding they can get it for elsewhere. And so just one of those ways that it can be tricky and difficult um, for our students to understand and navigate these emerging um, purchasing models. Another uh, example um, from an, a Texas institution is uh, down the street in, at UT Texas A&M, um, sorry, Texas A&M San Antonio, where students uh, had many concerns and the program ultimately shut down because students were super concerned, didn't understand the pricing, were, in, were overall dissatisfied um, with the day one program that they had implemented. And then finally, we think that there are even better ways um, to innovate within the instructional materials market. We believe that changes to instructional materials have the power to be transformative changes that actually help education work better for all students. Changes that allow us to reimagine the college educational materials paradigm, not just implement a new billing technique. And so here we have a student at UT Austin, Tanya Chin, who highlighted just a few of the benefits of open educational resources. Day one access, the free price tag, unlimited access, meaning you can always go and get it, download it, print it, do whatever you want with it, and there's no expiration. So with these subscription programs, often you have a set amount of access and then it's turned off. And I think that there are many other uh, types of innovations that OER allows for new markets, like new technologies on the next slide, um, that meet instructor and student needs. So instead of having the traditional monolithic model that the publishers have, where you have the publisher product or publisher textbook with the publisher online homework system, having a vast uh, choice to make when you can select which one actually meets your needs. So having a marketplace of these technology products. But I think even more exciting to me are the opportunities for continual improvement um, within our content. So on the next slide, I just listed three different ways that I think OER responds superbly um, to uh, innovation within this content market. So OER is highly collaborative, it's highly adaptable, and it allows us to update our content based on changes and discoveries in a given field. OER is equipped to respond to things like student needs, um, cultural uh, changes, current events, uh, and systemic issues. And when we think about the systemic issues, you know, our whole society has had to recently um, and, over, and overdue, uh, but we have recently started to grapple with systemic racism. In June, OpenStax put, as an organization, put out a release that really talked about our, our statement on racial justice, education, and our role. This wasn't the beginning of our work at OpenStax to address uh, uh, systemic racism within educational content, but it was a, a collective point of recognition of the urgency and importance with which OpenStax must respond to ensure that our work in our organization fully embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion in our content. This is something that I feel has always been at the center of open educational resources, trying to strive for equity. And now it's becoming explicit uh, and something that we realize that we have to continually work towards uh, improving. And I'll admit at OpenStax, we haven't always gotten this right and we will make mistakes again, but as an organization, we listen and we continue to grow and get better. Um, and so finally on this last slide, we are really thinking deeply about how to make open educational resources the absolute best. How do we incorporate new um, equity centered uh, approaches to education, bringing in diverse voices, engaging with diverse students to make sure that our content is the absolute uh, best and that you all through the open license can take and continue to build upon those innovations and move beyond a new billing mechanism to a new educational paradigm. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nathan, who's going to allow us to dig a little bit deeper uh, in a specific use case and probably provide even more exciting uh, data about how things kind of shake out at HCC. Thanks so much, Daniel. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's really cool to see we're now up to 60 participants in the session. So I hope you get something out of this. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about the experience of HCC and, and where we are. So my role at HCC is I'm the OER coordinator 
I'm a full-time philosophy instructor, but I have a teaching release to manage our Z degree program and our OER outreach program. Um, go ahead and advance the next slide. So when we started our Z degree program in fall of 2017, it was a pilot to try to tag courses and um, provide zero cost courses uh, for students with uh, aligned with a structured schedule so that students could complete a degree, uh, an associate's degree in two years without ever having to purchase a textbook. So that was the promise we made to students. And over two, um, after over two years, four semesters, we sort of step-by-step -step built out that degree program at our largest campus, uh, central campus. So those classes were, have been offered since um, a full slate of classes has been offered since the spring of 2019 um, for students at Central Campus to get an Associate of Arts in Business, an Associate of Arts in Multidisciplinary Studies, and an Associate of Science. So three degree programs at that campus. We also offer the degree programs online. And we have, we're, we're very close. Before the pandemic, we were almost to the point of being able to offer a core curriculum certificate at our um, nine largest campuses around the institution uh, and online. Um, and then of course that everything went online with the pandemic and it was, and so we're gonna have to rebuild, but we really are growing the program. In the process of doing that, you know, we did focus on cost. And so when we were approached by our bookstore, our Barnes and Noble bookstore, and publishers about uh, another cost savings program, a textbook savings program that they called First Day, which is essentially the inclusive access program. Um, we thought, well, let's roll that into this broader effort. Um, so now we kind of have an um umbrella uh, uh, project called textbook savings. And I created this little quasi complicated Venn diagram thing um, to try to describe the relationship between the various um, various uh, things we have going on. So we have our OER outreach program. Now some OER is offered through First Day and Inclusive Access. So for instance, we have vendors like Lumen Learning and Panopen that charge a course fee and you can get their, their, uh, their uh, materials through that. Some of the OER, um, are purchased by students at a low cost. We have our low cost threshold is $40 for all of the instructional materials new. Then we have our zero cost books tag. Um, we empower faculty to use library resources, open access resources, online content, as well as OER to get to that zero cost point. Um, and then our Z degree is a subset of those zero cost books that are in that structured schedule that I was talking about. Next slide. So since fall of 2017, you can kind of see the growth of the program uh, where uh, we have the zero cost books there in the, um, the light orange and the uh, low cost books in the, in the darker orange. And over time, you can see we've grown. We are now, in the, as of the fall, we're, we're getting above 9,000 student enrollments in uh, zero cost books courses and above 3,000 uh, student enrollments in low cost books courses. So this represents a significant impact. Um, I wanna go to the next slide. And this is kind of astonishing, right? Uh, from my perspective, as somebody who's been trying to build this program for, for the last three years, because here you see what has happened in just the last two years uh, since we launched a small pilot of that first day inclusive access program. Um, essentially that had growth has essentially dwarfed the accomplishments that we've made in our open educational resources program. And I think it's um, the reason for this as I would say is that effectively what inclusive access promises faculty is that they can have their cake and eat it too. They can, they can keep the same materials. They don't have to change anything and they get to address the cost savings. Um, you know, they can, they can make it cheaper for students. Students have the materials on the first day. So they get everything. And they look at OER, a lot of faculty for the first time look at OER as an additional workload for them. 
they have to change their textbook, they might have to redo some of their teaching materials, they may not have all of the, the, the resources that they're accustomed to getting from the publishers. And so, um, so for, for them, this is a very attractive option uh, to kind of just, to kind of charge this fee for the courses and, and then, um, and then they, they, can, they can save the students money, some money, uh, but um, they don't have to change. We'll go on to the next slide. So, but I wanna talk a little bit about why that from my perspective at HCC um, doesn't, isn't really fully accurate. And here's why. So obviously we understand that textbook savings is a big deal for students, right? The text, the reason is because textbook costs are an out of pocket effect uh, expense for students. Out of pocket expenses, even if they're just $100 or $75 can be a, a lot, for, especially for our most, our most vulnerable students, the students with the least resources. Um, we also know that over time, I mean, those, those that $100 there here, $100 there, when you add up to, you know, your uh, 60, uh, uh, courses for an associate's degree or 120 courses for a bachelor's, you, you, you get thousands and thousands of dollars added to the total tab for your um, college education. So if we can reduce the cost, we can reduce debt, we can increase access, we can increase um, the affordability of college. And in the past, we in OER movement have kind of settled on some very sort of rough metrics of cost savings. So initially we used to just take our enrollments, multiply by hundred and say, we're saving students this amount of money. Um, of course, you know, that's, that hundred dollars is an average and it's, 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 it's not precise. So maybe you get a little bit more advanced and you start actually tracking what is the full price of the textbook for this particular course. And then you subtract the cost associated with OER and you get to a number that's a little bit more accurate. This is in fact what the, the bookstores who are promoting their inclusive access uh, do. They, they just, uh, they take the list price for the, the product, they take the savings and they say, well, we're saving students this amount of money. The problem with that, of course, is that students don't typically purchase their textbooks at full list price from the bookstore. Very few students do that, in fact. Most students are buying used, buying rented, borrowing textbooks, finding another option. They are going elsewhere, right? So what we ought to do is we ought to factor that student behavior into the cost that we, we assume students are paying. I've done this through surveys at HCC where I've asked, where we ask students what they, how they purchase textbooks. And what I calculate, and this is rough, I'm not an economist and I'm trying to get kind of the best sense, but I came to about that about 56 and a half percent of the list price is what the average student is actually paying for a textbook. And, you know, it turns out I actually wound up right in the middle of what Achieving the Dream arrived at when they looked at their um, OER degree program data from their 17 different institutions that provided them information about this. So it looks like you know, as a just a rough estimate, at least at community colleges, students are actually only paying on average 55 to 57% of the list price. Now that might reduce the big impact number that we can sell as the savings for our OER program. But I think it also really uh, puts a question mark on, the, on how much money are these inclusive access programs actually saving students. Let's go to the next slide. But as Daniel said, cost is only part of the picture. Here's what I think the real transformative power of OER is. And that is that um, over time, once you move to OER, you might have some initial costs, right? You're gonna need to incentivize faculty adoption. You're gonna need to provide some stipends so faculty can do the work of transitioning, right? But those costs then become yours. You don't, it's like, it's, it's like the difference between renting and buying a house. You gain equity over time. With, uh, with these inclusive access models, we are on a subscription service model. We will never stop paying that amount over time. 
With OER, we own the materials. They are ours, and over time, the cost drops. But even more important than that, I think it changes our teaching and learning model. So what's the model that the publishers offer us? Well, they have certain people who are knowledge creators. These are the authors. The publishers act as a gatekeeper, right? Certifying who can be a knowledge creator. Teachers then assume a role of merely transmitting the knowledge that is created by others to students. And then what's the role of students? Simply receive. That model is what Paolo Ferrer calls the banking model of education. And the reality is the banking model of education is bankrupt. It doesn't actually provide for genuine teaching and learning. By contrast, OER allows a much more cyclical sort of engaged process where authors, teachers can be authors, students can become authors. With the remixing and revising process, there's genuine engagement in, uh, in learning. Next slide. So what I've tried to do when I teach faculty about OER is I try to bring this home to them, right? So we go through, I have an online training module that I've created for our faculty at HCC. We go through OER, the basics, what are copyright, what is open licensing, what's public domain, what, what does that all mean? Then we go through some search stuff, how do you find OER? But then we really get into teaching and learning. We talk about course design, we talk about course mapping, we talk about adapting resources, and then we get into pedagogy. How can you change your pedagogical practice with OER? I'm gonna show you how I've done that in my course. Next slide. What I've done is I've created what's called a personal project in my Intro to Ethics course. It's a, it's a multi-step process where, where students are asked to produce something that will, that will help other students in the course. Next slide. So they go through many steps. They give me a proposal, we do a draft, and, we, and then they submit the final project. But then I take those projects and I incorporate them back into the course. So here's an example. We do a section on um, the youth of Fro, which is a dialogue by Plato. And here you can see a number of resources that have been generated by other students, which are now in the course. Infographics, this cool comic, a video with audio over, overlay explaining it. So students are teaching students, their work is going back into the course, they're being involved with their own learning. Next slide. So before, as I wrap up, we wrap up here, I wanna just kind of leave you, this is a messy slide and I apologize, um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, I, but I wanted to give you some sense of kind of what faculty are saying about these various textbook models. So you can see over time, um, we have increased some adoption. So we went from like 31% in 2017 to 20, uh, 37% in 2020 where of programs adopting OER. Um, with faculty, it's even better. We've gone from 38% to 50, almost 52% of faculty are using OER at least sometimes in their course. Um, the quality ratings has played, stayed pretty similar. Um, maybe it's gone down a little bit as we've increased the pool of people who are using. Um, and, and this is really driven by the fact that faculty are extremely concerned about the cost of course of textbooks to students. Over 50% of our faculty say they are extremely concerned. However, faculty are still really committed to the resources that are provided by publishers. And here you can see this, how important would you rate the, the, the homework management or learning management system that publishers provide? over 70% say it's very important or essential. This makes the transition to OER very difficult and is I think the reason why for the growth in the inclusive access. Next slide. When I asked those faculty how they like the inclusive access program, um, most faculty, a large percentage say they think it's a good value for students. They believe it actually has improved student success. That's very high percentage, 67%, and they rate um, they rate it highly in terms of its value relative to other instructional materials. Let's look at the student perspective. Next slide. Here is a really interesting finding that we find. Students still, you may hear that we are now in the digital age and all these students, they don't, they don't read anymore. That's not true. Students still like to, they prefer textbooks that are printed if they have the option. However, they are extremely price sensitive. 
So once we ask them if they would if they would prefer an online book if it were significantly cheaper, the numbers flip. Suddenly they 60 in the 60s, 70 percent agree strongly agree that they would prefer that digital copy as if it was significantly cheaper. And if it was free, you get up to 80 percent. We started asking students why they don't purchase textbooks, and, and we get about a quarter of students say they didn't purchase a textbook because they couldn't afford it. So it's impacting a lot of our students. Um, we know that about 30% of our students aren't purchasing materials on time because they have a delay in receiving their financial aid. And we also know that almost 40% of our students are spending greater than $300 a semester on their textbooks. So they're still spending a lot that has gone down a little bit in the last year, maybe due to some of these programs. Let's look at the next slide. We remember what the faculty said about how student, how, how effective the inclusive access program was. They were up in the 60s, 70s, even 80% on those answers. Look at what the students are saying. It's much lower. So students actually are saying, yeah, okay, this looks like a good deal, but not quite half of them are saying that. Um, do you think that the program helped you prepare for tests or exams? Yeah, maybe. Faculty think uh, at 70% think that they're, it's helping them. Students, they're 46%. Would you re recommend it? That's less than 50% agree or strongly agree that they would recommend this program to a friend. So I think when we dig a little bit deeper, we can see that there are some questions about the program and, that, and, and, and I think student, the student opinions are, are, are varied. But uh, that's the end of my session. Let, let, I think we, we have a couple of students here who can actually share with us their opinions. Um, so we we'll get uh, introduce our students. Excellent. So we... Barbara, Christine, yeah. excellent. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and just give you kind of a general question um, and ask you. Um, first of all, Christine, can you give us a little bit of background? Kind of you, I know, have had a lot of different, worn a lot of different hats. What has been your experience with? some of the models that we've talked about, open educational resources, the access codes, and then the um, inclusive access model in your experience. And just tell us a little bit about who you are too when you start, thank you. No problem, well, thank you so much for having me. Good morning, my name is Christine Montpoint and I currently serve Houston Community College as the district student government president. Um, I have a couple different experiences with this topic, as Dr. Smith mentioned. So um, my first experience actually was when I took my first psychology class my freshman year um, at Lone Star. And I had the psychology open stacks book. And I thought it was so, I was like, oh, this is great. This is one less book I have to buy. And I really enjoyed it. But I also wanted a physical book. And they're like, oh, well, if you want, you can go buy a physical, physical book. And I was like, man, like how much is it gonna be? And I think at the time it was like 20 or $25. And I was like, yes. <laughs> like. I'm really hyped up and excited about this. Um, that was a really great class. And I felt like um, my professor was able to um, speak to us in a way that allowed us to draw the psychology into where we were in the time and not like an older textbook where it was just kind of giving you definitions with no current real life examples. So I think it was a really great class to be a part of. Um, shortly after that semester, I started working at Fowlett Corporation, which is one of the major bookstore companies that are in a college system. And I worked there for four years and I did work specifically with textbooks, with the publishers. And so a lot of like what I shared with Dr. Smith offline was that students were having a lot of complications when they would come into the bookstore and they didn't really understand what they were buying. They saw that the book was shrink wrap, but they didn't understand that it had an access code. So sometimes they lose their access code and then they have to buy a whole new book or just the standalone access code, not realizing that they couldn't just get a book. You know, they had to make an additional purchase, um, not realizing they couldn't sell books back to the bookstore was really frustrating for a lot of students. Um, and so that was a, a, an ongoing thing every semester, never changes, um, and, and just kind of negotiate with the publishers um, to get a certain number of textbooks and things to that magnitude. And the last thing I'll say is that um, in my experience at HCC, now that I attend this uh, institution, they actually have been very good about showing you little like um, indicators 
of um, how much the textbooks cost or what you're signing up for, what kind of class it is. So does it include a textbook? Is it a no cost textbook? Uh, what does that look like? So that has been really, really cool. Um, just because I know a lot of students, again, have challenges with the bookstore. And so um, I actually, um, in a higher education policy fellowship, and one of the bills that we are looking at is House Bill 1027. And that is what they're focusing on um, is to make sure that course markings are available to students and they actually know how much students are going to be paying for those textbooks and those, those course materials. So um, a lot of different areas and where I've seen textbooks affect students. Um, and really personally, like there are semesters that I just didn't buy a textbook because I was like, man, I don't have the money right now. I can't do this, I'm relying on other students. And you can only get by when it doesn't have an access code. So definitely had the ringer of experiences in the textbook arena. Thank you so much, Christine. That is a really helpful uh, perspective. I want to turn it over to Barbara, if you could just talk a little bit about who you are, what your experience, are, your varied experiences with, with um, the different textbook models and, um, and how, you, how you see this playing out. I think you might be muted. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Barbara Gooch. I'm actually a student in Tennessee at Ball State Community College. Um, it's nice to meet everybody. Yeah, some of my, um, well, first of all, let me ask you to repeat that question just because I was muting and got a little distracted. <laughs> no problem. Just looking to hear you like your stories and experiences with various textbook models from OER to inclusive access to using access codes and learning and the homework management systems. What, what is your sense of all that? Yes, thank you. Yes, I thought you asked the same one, but I wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, so part of my um, experience with inclusive access is actually this semester. Um, and what had happened is we have a list on the library of what, what to purchase. And um, so I went ahead and saw that the, you know, it was just books is what it was. So I went ahead and purchased the book early, which is something I generally don't do. I usually wait to class, but it's trying to be a little bit more productive and went ahead and purchased it, you know, shopped online, asked students in a student group, hey, do you have this available? You know, so I do the whole, you know, let's try to save as much as possible also. So when I got into the course, the professor actually said, hey, you need to purchase this inclusive access. And I was like, you know, sir, I already purchased the book. Do we need the inclusive access? And he said, yes, to access your homework. Um, I like to refer to that as homework behind the paywall. Someone else had mentioned that in another conference and I love that idea, you know. Um, but anyhow, so, um, I thought, you know, it was in a class that I had to have, and I thought, well, I've already spent this much money, I can at least return it, um, and then having to purchase on top of that, I'll go ahead and drop, but our school, the first day that you attend, you're automatically having to pay back 25%, and I was like, well, that's the cost of the inclusive access, <laughs> so I went ahead and purchased it, so not only did I have the print textbook, and I actually do prefer print textbook also, but I did have to purchase this access code to have my homework. Um, another professor actually had that you had it on the library textbook thing, had that you had to um, purchase a textbook or inclusive access. And I went ahead and asked him and he said, no, I don't know why they're putting that. I've told them not to get that. You only need a textbook. And so he was able to you know, he he was great about working with the other students. I said, look, it's it's listed on there is you must purchase this and stuff. And he immediately uh, tried to work with students to get their money back because they were automatically billing and he didn't want them to be automatically billed. So, you know, within the library, there seems to be a little bit of confusion on, you know, what to do and stuff like that. But um opting out I asked him how to opt out and stuff like that and he was like you'd have to get the library and then the library had to send me to link so the opting out issue it, it was it was crazy but it does go to the point he was willing to let us have the textbook we were already being charged he wanted to make sure that we were able to opt out 
But the other professor, you can't opt out. If you opt out, your grade is automatically messed up. I would have zero, you know, because everything is behind that inclusive access code. So I think that, you know, it, it, it's either you pay it or your, your grade's affected. And I think that's very unfair to students that, like Nathan had mentioned, uh, Mr. Smith had mentioned, you know, you have no choice to purchase it. You're, you're, you don't have any, you know, almost free market to look around to find, you know, what can I purchase at a cheaper price? Um, if you want that print textbook, you, you just don't have, it's going to be an extra fee on top of it, you know? Um, and, and so usually I end up not buying it because I'm like, well, I'm already spending this much money on a, you know, on the digital copy and stuff. Um, other issues, I actually have um, a son and a daughter, actually two daughters, myself and my husband are actually all attending college right now. Um, my daughter had to purchase an inclusive access code and it cost her $250 for essentially two semester access. And she just looked at me like, mom, what, you know, and I said, you know, we're okay. We can, you know, we can afford it and stuff, but that's, that's a lot of money for some people. And we don't, we don't get, you know, help to cover our textbooks. So, um, Thank goodness we're in that position, but that's a normal thing for us is with four people that we're purchasing textbooks for every year. That's huge. That's a lot of money that's going out. And the higher you get, the more, you know, my son's textbooks cost. And it, it's just, you know, there's been a few times we've just kind of looked and had a, you know, just grin and bear it, I guess. Um, but we weren't able to even, you know, look around or anything. Um, my husband has noticed a lot of issues with uh, some of the questions. Of course, with with these access codes or inclusive access, they just, you know, they use the test banks and uh, the quizzes and stuff like that. So I think sometimes the professors either they can't change it or they just don't even, I don't know if they just don't even notice what it says or whatever, but he, um, there's been some questions. He's had to email the professor and like, why am I missing this? The other thing is, I'm just not even understanding it the way they're worded. The other thing is, this wasn't even in the material. This is just one course that he has had issue after issue after issue. So much so that even the professor's like, yeah, I'm not understanding that either. Or yes, that was wrong. Let me fix that for you. Um, so that's that's been a lot of our issues with inclusive access. So I wanted to go ahead and say some of the pros of it um, that other students actually did a survey, uh, just a very inorganic, I guess you can say, poll in my student group and ask some questions. And some of the pros that the students liked was portability. Um, and I think that professors love the easy setup, the homework, the test, the quiz, they're all built in. However, like I talked about, there was some issues with that. Um, the cons, I'm gonna back up what Nathan said, three to one students wanted print still. Um, that that kind of surprised me. I thought that was just me. It's not. Most students, young, old, it didn't matter. They wanted that physical copy. They want to be able to look around and stuff like that. You know, um, the other con is, is we're right now we're <laughs> most everybody is online and we're, of course, facing a digital divide where can they even access this? You know, do they even have the broadband within, you know, the rural areas or lower income families to even get access to this? And that's, you know, a huge issue. Um, yet in, in that, I want to say that there are certain courses such as like computer applications, accounting, math, I could see a benefit. There is a benefit for the accuracy um, the skill level needed for that course to make sure to teach, um, I, you know, with the computer application class, I could see that that was very beneficial to be able to monitor what I was doing. Um, not, I, I shouldn't say it is monitoring what I was doing, but more so just the skill level it needed to, to correct what I was doing, like within Word to teach me or something like that, that 
I don't think a professor would have been able to. So I get that. I understand that. I understand that, you know, some of the math, you know, might have more videos or hands on to help you with that. Um, I haven't taken math yet. Part of that is because I, because the high cost of inclusive access, I'm kind of hoping to clap out of it completely. Um, however, I think that you know, students are right now, they're also paying that technology fee for the learning management system. And I think that if at all possible, if you're going to do an online course and students are already paying for it, I think that you should be able to try your best to use that learning management system before having to make a student pay that homework behind the paywall. Um, I did want to touch on OER a little bit at our campus. Um, right now, we really don't have much OER. I've tried to work and stuff like that. It's not very big at our campus. Um, if they do have OER, it's not like the OER like OpenStax. It's more of a let me link you to this video or what, look at this article or something that they kind of built within PowerPoints and stuff like that. But a actual textbook in that fashion, we just, I think there might be one open stacks that are, um, and not much other, uh, you know, textbooks that I know of at our campus. So I, it, there really is a need to grow and there's not having that. Um, However, there's hope. Tennessee has started a Tennessee Open Education program, and they also have the Tennessee Textbook Affordability Task, Task Force that is looking at not only inclusive access, but also looking at um, open education resources. And uh, I'll give a little shout out to Elizabeth Spica, who just got her PhD and did, it, did her dissertation on um, textbook affordability and has done leaps and bound to help people show or look at OER more within Tennessee. So I'm kind of excited about it. However, um, there is one very concerning bill in Tennessee. It's called SB 1019. And it proposes to actually limit, and, it, and I don't think it means to, but it's really doing great harm to OER. Um, is it'll end up limiting the OER. It is almost a push toward inclusive access. Um, and the issue of surrounding it, and it, it, I even proposed it to Daniel and it was it was a very weird bill, you know, and like, what, what does this mean and stuff? I was able to learn a little bit and it's a, if you are already a vendor of inclusive access, you have the chance to bid. But if you're not a vendor, you don't even get that chance. And it's a, but you must use this inclusive access if at all possible, which within Tennessee, we have um, the right to, um, let's say, I'm trying to think. Um, to to choose your textbook and stuff we're supposed to do that and i'm afraid that's going to limit that but i apologize i think i went way over five minutes and um just got me a little list and went through it so um if you have any questions i'd love to hear from you guys and thank you for this opportunity and i did forget to mention i am an open sex internship to intern to be at full disclosure <laughs> thank you barbara um so i have a Quick follow up question, and then I, we have a one question in the the chat. So, Christine, I had a question for you. You mentioned um, course marking, so I'm really interested in how you, as a student, use course marking to kind of make decisions. And then I was also curious if you could comment on like professors and transparency around like how they're using textbooks and other resources. There we go. Okay, I'm like trying to make sure I'm unmuted. But um, thank you so much. I was actually going to tie two of those things together. So um, one of the things that I mentioned is how HCC have like these little like bubbles, and it would say like a forty dollar course or like this is a you know a, a textbook that's already included like an access code or um, you know this is a zero cost course, um, and so that was really helpful. But one of the things that I'm still having trouble with is when professors send. So so this is what my understanding is as somebody who worked for a college bookstore. 
we contact the department chair to say, we need you and all your professors to send all your information to the bookstore. And when the professors don't send their books in a timely manner, it doesn't allow the bookstore to purchase the right number of copies. That's infraction number one. But the even bigger infraction is that for some of those larger course groups like English 1301, uh, Math 1314, the bookstore will then make an assumption that if they did not receive a textbook that the teacher is using whatever the department chair is like suggesting. So then they say and this is kind of what you you know alluded to barbara was how um they're like well on there it said it was a required material but then you get to class and your professor has what i would label as an open educational resource because it's some type of online book or some type of online platform where you didn't have to pay for it or some access to the material but because they did not communicate with the bookstore or whoever you know is not communicating with the bookstore students are purchasing things they don't need um and so now it's creating the hassle of going to return or you have a textbook and you're not exactly sure what's going on and so for some and to go back to Ms. Dunn's question, I think some professors rely so heavily <clears throat> on the textbook um, that you know they they send out their emails and they're like, you need to buy this, 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 this. You need to have these materials. You need to do all of these things that I have listed here. They haven't communicated to the bookstore, so then the students don't have what they need, and the bookstore doesn't have enough copies for the students. Uh, um, and then instead of like communicating with the students like hey maybe we won't read all five novels at one time you should kind of you know let, let's go as go as we can um a lot of students are very confused about what to do so i um have a lot of students come into the bookstore and they're like okay there's like seven books for my history class should i buy them all now are you going to have them when i need them what should i do do i like rent them do i purchase them and so i think that um professors could do a little bit better about really explaining what they need and why they need it. So if you say to your students, so you have the option to buy the access code because there are some additional materials, but it's not required, that is a much better experience than the bookstore telling you, well, it has an access code, it's probably required because you have to do your homework and now you've wasted your money. Um, and so that's always been my experience is that I don't feel like professors are are transparent enough through the institutional channels to make sure that students are getting the information that they need. A lot of times as well, professors are like copy and paste syllabus templates. And so um, they may have like an old edition um, ISBN on their syllabus and then you go to look for that book and you can't find it. Um, and it's just a very frustrating experience for students, I feel like in with, um, like so I'm in a course right now, my professor put a textbook on the syllabus, but then she says, you must read my introductory email to complete this course. And then I go in the introductory email and it has a, a open educational resource book that or, or a platform that I can use to complete the course. But why not mention that on the syllabus? Is there you know issues with professors feeling uncomfortable about talking about OER? Do they feel like they're not supposed to do that? I have a lot of questions about that as a student as to why the information is not presented up front. Uh, but I would love to see a lot more uh, professor to student transparency and even institutional department chairs to the bookstore transparency to really help students. Thank you. Yeah, really helpful information. I, I think that idea of like, are people uncomfortable talking about OER? I know in the past, um, we had at OpenStax had heard that, where professors had concern about whether or not they could use OER, or if it was allowed or, or encouraged. So I think pointing that out is something that's important. I know that um, one of the things we have encouraged administrators to do is actually send out an explicit email to staff saying or faculty saying we would love for you to use this it is not a mandate but you know if you want to you have that ability i think that goes can go a long way so we only have two minutes left um barbara i was wondering if you had um any thoughts on one of the questions that came in uh, around do do you think that uh, instructors sometimes rely too heavily on textbooks or other resources? Um, you know, I can understand why you would want some kind of textbook. It does help enforce the lectures and stuff. I'm the type that actually do better just reading a textbook than sometimes the lectures itself. Um, it's, it is going to go back and help, you know, reinforce that or whatever. 
what I think they rely more on is that actually, like I talked about that homework behind the paywall, um, where we are now mandating students purchase the inclusive access or access code to get homework, um, access to their homework. And I just, I, I just, the whole idea of it just bothers me um, in the fact that, you know, if you're paying tuition, which should include homework, why are you having to pay for your homework separately? Um, it's almost like you're buying another professor. And, I, you know, um, I don't have a problem with that if it was a little bit cheaper, but some of them are just as outrageous if you're just buying a textbook. Um, I get with going online even quicker and stuff like that, they needed something quick. So I'm not, you know, faulting professors for wanting something that's ease, but what is it, you know, doing to the student's pocketbook? You know, the, you know, I, and I even think about, you know, me and my children being first generation students. Um, I had a little bit of practice with my first daughter who went before us, you know, learning about textbooks and stuff like that and the costs and stuff, but you might ha not have that parental support and stuff and the student goes in thinking, you know, okay, this is what the tuition costs, and then bang, these massive textbook, you know, or they range from 40 something to 200 something. I think that's very important to think about, um, yes, what your textbook costs are. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Christy. Always amazing to hear from students directly. Uh, and Nathan, thank you as well. I think we are at time. Um, so I guess, I guess we'll say goodbye. If you need to get in touch with anybody, I will throw my um, email in the chat real quick. Um, feel free to email us and uh, I'll respond. Thank you and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, speakers. Thank you.